So uh, the way we're going to structure this future of Linux uh, discussion, um, the first part we're going to talk about is containers and clouds, uh, with, you know, kind of like where some parts, some some initiatives within Linux are, are headed, um, and then we'll open up for discussion ostensibly around System D. But the gentleman who is going to be leading the System D part uh, may, you know, come through the door at the last second. Um, otherwise, Howard is a uh, former NBUG president, and he will ensure that we have a very thorough and fair conversation about system. It sucks! Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> all right, so thank you all so much for your patience, and uh, I think we're ready to get started. So, uh, who am I? Uh, uh, Wesley Duffy Braun, uh, Twitter at W Photos, and uh, I'm a photographer, I'm a woodworker, and then during the day, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, so, yeah, but I am up here as a long-time 20-year Linux user, not as a Red Hatter. So, on camera and everything, I'm just here as another open source person, not a uh, Red Hat. Would you say that your views represent Red Hat? No! Oh, okay. And I Maybe. Agree, but just a second, I mean, Wes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding the uh, open source comment, Tillman knows this one. <clears throat> uh, our dear friend Allison Smith got an award from your fine company, by the way. And she mentioned it to her uh, colleagues, and the guy says, you got an award for open sores? <laughs> wow. Um, so, uh, what was I gonna say something about? Oh, yeah, I have no idea if my views represent Red Hat. I'm sure in the other, seven plus thousand whatevers that are out there, there's somebody else who agrees, and then plenty who disagree with whatever I'm about to say. All right, so who here is familiar with Linux? Raise hands. All right, so uh, this is a majority of uh, folks are, are familiar with it. Um, if, uh, so we'll, we'll do a very quick thing. We don't have to talk about all these goodies about it, but the thing to remember with Linux uh, is, is it is an operating system. Um, strictly speaking, it is the kernel, uh, although I haven't heard anyone reference GNU Linux in a while. It is, uh, you know, there, there are utilities, and then there's the kernel. Often, it's just reference, you just say Linux. Um, and uh, based on Unix, originally, uh, <coughs> Linus Torvalds, founder of Linux, put a post out on the Comp Minix, I think it was? Comp OS uh, Minix, Minix. Uh, thread um, in August of 91 saying he was working on a uh, semi-similar clone, but he was like, I'm sure it's never going to go anywhere, it'll probably never run on anything except 86, uh, 386 machines. Um, but uh, it was, it, the conversation picked up steam. Um, first GPL release was in December of 92. Who knows what the GPL is? Everybody familiar with open source? Um, okay, great. So, uh, and then just now, latest kernel posted uh, earlier, I guess now, two weeks ago, 4.3. So some 24 years on, it is uh, going very strong. It went from just one little box to uh, being a server, generally speaking, server operating system. Some people were running it on their desktop, and now it's everywhere, your phones, uh, networks, your wireless cards, your uh, pretty much you could grab five dozen things in this room that are running some variant of Linux or embedded Linux or some something along those lines. Um, so when we talk about the future of Linux, it's like it's like saying, well, where is the human? You know, what are humans working on? Right? It's like everything. So, uh, you know, where's Linux headed? Everywhere. It is uh, growing, more people are adopting it. Um, there are forks of it all the time. Forks, if you're not familiar, is when a code base, you know, there's the original code base and then people branch off with it. Um, there are uh, companies that are utilizing Linux. Um, there are uh, agreements between long you know, not get along with each other, folks utilizing Linux and open source philosophy. It's hard to separate, in a way, Linux from open source. 
Um, but uh, when we talk about where Linux is headed, it's um, it's kind of going everywhere. So what I was thinking about with this part of it is to say, where are people using it um, in, in the future, right? So there are folks that are going to use it or are working on using it for very big workloads. And then there are folks who are working on using it for very small workloads. Um, and those very big workloads are being found in uh, the cloud, right? But and we'll talk about what the cloud is in context of this conversation momentarily. Um, and then very small workloads are with uh, containers. Um, and uh, what that means as well, because that's kind of an overloaded term that has now kind of settled into um, a kind of a consistent definition. Um, so what is the cloud? Uh, there is a definition of the cloud. Um, and it says that the cloud is a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. Um, it's distributed computing. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's pretty much anything could be squeezed into that definition, um, I, I think, in a way. Um, almost anything, right? Uh, but the important part of this is that it does not have to be somewhere else, right? The idea that you're that if you are doing cloud workloads, big workloads, that they have to be in some far off place that you can never touch, is not um, for purposes of this conversation anyway what I mean here. There are public clouds and private clouds and hybrid clouds and, and though that's a whole other conversation. The uh, idea when we're talking about under clouds. Um, the idea is that with, with cloud computing that you can have these five characteristics. And this is where people are, are I think that this is not just where Linux is going, but I think the idea is that many companies' workloads are headed in this direction, and they're leveraging Linux and open source technology to <coughs> enable this, uh, these characteristics in their environments. Um, On-demand self-service, broad network access, uh, meaning that you can access a resource from your phone as well as a system that is at your house, as well as something that's in your um, in an actual data center. Right? You don't have to be physically located in one specific place to do that. Now, uh, you may have to s authenticate or set up VPNs, you know, certificate uh, exchanges, but you don't have to be sitting at one place to be able to access one specific network. Um, resource pooling. Uh, that you can take multiple systems and they will appear to the consumer um, like one one resource. Um, so if you have a whole bunch of CPUs, the uh, consumer won't necessarily know that or even care. It will just say, here's my computation, uh, my computation abilities. Uh, rapid elasticity, so you can scale up if you are uh, having people uh, you upload a whole bunch of photos, and all of a sudden you need two terabytes more space. The, the people uploading the photos won't see that. It will just be automatically provisioned. And then measured service, so uh, folks can um, know how much is being consumed, uh, both on the consumer side and on the um, administrative side. The stop if there's any questions, concerns, disagreements um, with any of, any of this uh, information here. Um, so cloud computing categories, we've all been using them for a while, I think, They're especially the software as a service. Uh, Gmail and Tumblr, for example, um, anybody use Salesforce or anything related to that? Yeah, software as a service, right? Um, then there's platform as a service, uh, where you um, 
can develop on a, 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 a platform that someone else has for you, but you don't have to actually worry about doing the maintenance of that platform, right? You just say, like, I want um, a, a PHP environment. I'm sorry? Well, to an extent, it would be the um, AMP side of that. Yeah. Um, but the infrastructure as a service would be the LAMP stack. Yeah. You're, you're really talking about how much of the stack you're managing yourself versus you're paying somebody else to. So yes. for, for most users, all we really care about is the application layer. Everything else that you do with the computer is to give you a stable platform for the application layer. Right. So, you know, you can get you know, platform as a service or software as a service just to focus all of your energy on your program, your app, the thing that makes your company different from everybody else, and pay somebody else to manage the servers to keep everything up to date. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So um, the the thing I should have said at the beginning is that, or at, at one of the slides further back with the very big and very small workloads, is that not either of these cloud or containers are exclusive to each other, nor are they one better than the other. Um, a lot of companies will see a feature uh, set of cloud computing, for instance, as, oh, this is what we need. Then other ones will be like, oh, containers, that's that's all we need, just containers. We just want to give everybody containers. We'll get to that uh, momentarily. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to pass along is how to do cloud computing for yourself. Um, who's heard of OpenStack? Who's used OpenStack? Yes? Great. No, raise it high, man. There it is. <laughs> well, everybody's just a little bit anyway. I mean, it's so, you know, it's, it's like every six months it's like something different. Um, so uh, OpenStack, uh, if you haven't heard of OpenStack, it is uh, much the same as we say Linux, and what we mean under the hood is the kernel and the utilities and a lot of the times the philosophy and all of that. OpenStack is a set of interrelated projects um, that deliver various components for a cloud infrastructure solution. Uh, the three key ones are compute, networking, and storage. So. Um, you, who's familiar with uh, KVM or um, you know virtual machine, <coughs> virtual box, right? Virtual, any of them. Uh, that's the compute side, right? That's that is shared computational resources. Um, networking, though, and uh, storage is something that OpenStack gives that's a little uh, new, but the concept is much the same, right? Just like you would spin up a um, uh, 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 under KVM, you would you know say, well, I want this system, and it's going to have this many cores, uh, and all the other stuff, right? You know, the the how much memory it has and, and whatnot. But really, what you're doing is building uh, the the computation was the first thing I think that people kind of got their heads around. OpenStack is the same. So if you want to have a, uh, a, a a store that is a block level store presented to your um, virtual devices, um, but is not stored with your virtual devices, right? And your virtual machines, I'm sorry. Because so, you know, usually when you spin up a virtual machine, when you turn it off, the storage goes away, right? So um, the same when uh, the way that OpenStack gets around it is by saying you have your storage over here, you have a little bit of storage allocated to the virtual uh, system, but most of the workload will live on this other storage over here that behind the scenes could be a SAN, or it could be SSDs, it could be all sorts of stuff, who cares, right? Um, go ahead. I was gonna ask, yeah. what, do you know some examples of some big deployments using OpenStack? So yes, some yes. companies or projects what they're doing with it? Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a good, that's much more exciting. We'll do this. So who uses OpenStack? CERN, all that stuff they generate when they turn on the Earth Killer thing, right? Uh, yeah, I know, right? Uh, is uh, all of that has to go somewhere, and it has to be written out very fast, right? And they cannot have um, latency 
when they are when they are pushing all their results out to storage. Um, so they utilize OpenStack for uh, their um, for the storage of their results. Um, the others that I pulled from here, oh, I think uh, Purdue uses it for, um, and don't quote me on this, it was a brief, like, making sure that I even had them down correctly. Um, but I think they use it as part of their labs. So if you need to set up a, a, an environment, uh, you can utilize OpenStack for that. Um, Wikimedia Foundation uses it to store uh, media files. Who's heard of object storage? Yeah. S3. S3, <coughs> right, yeah, who's used S3 before? Okay, yeah, so um, there's, there's kind of like three types of storage, right? There's block storage, um, there's file storage, uh, and then there's object storage. Um, object storage is where, uh, if you've ever used like a RESTful API to get an image, right? Like something out of like Flickr, if you've ever done any Flickr API stuff, it's all, or anything S3, um, that it means you're, you, you don't really care about like where on disk the file starts or the picture starts. You just say, give me this picture and let me know when I have a picture that has been delivered. Um, so it's, um, we, could, we could way sidetrack into object storage, but, um, but, it, but it is different from block storage. OpenStack provides that capabilities natively. Um, where to get OpenStack? Did I already have that? Yeah, start openstack.org slash software slash start. It's free, it's open source. Um, you can run it uh, on one box. Um, and, and I highly recommend it. It is, it is, it takes the idea of provisioning and makes it so easy. Like, uh, who has ever fought with KVM and scripting out Versh stuff? It is horrible, horrible, horrible. Um, OpenStack makes it a lot easier to, to do. Um, so, so let's so say, for example, that I have a network attached storage in my house. Yeah. How do I transition from, as you say, block? I mean, far less than even uh, iSCSI or anything of that, of that level of, uh, of drill down. But uh, OK, I want to I wanna take advantage of how do I do it? And you know, you know, I've got a dying NAS. I need to get rid of it. I need something that that I can dedupe the 15 copies of pictures I got. Is that part of a, a part of this concept, or am I am I overstating it? No, I don't think you're overstating it. So what you would probably do is you would uh, mount. How do you normally mount the shared uh, SMB? SMB. Okay, so. Um, there are translators where you could present that. Um, you, would, you would start OpenStack. Uh, the component that runs object, or I'm sorry, block storage is called a uh, sender. And there's probably, I think there's a sender, yeah, SMB translator. So you would. Uh, and these okay. translators would live on a separate, or, or you know, how separate or how, can, yeah. how homogenous is this going to be? So it's all, it can all be homogenous. Um, to get just a smidge into it, you have uh, systems that are called your controllers and systems that are called your compute nodes. Your controllers uh, are the things that control the components, right? They, it's all based on um, Rabbit, well, AMQP. These days, I think RabbitMQ is the uh, messaging platform. Um, and so you would have on your compute node a, a VM that has a script to run everything, right? An, uh, an instance running of whatever. And then you would uh, create a sender instance, mount your SMB drive, and then let it go to town. Um, what you could do is carve that up though, right? So if you want to have 16 instances, each taking a part of your SMB thing and going through and looking for copies and then writing it off somewhere else, that's where you could have uh, the the DDoS stuff into it. So, so you use OpenStack at home. I, I mean, you said you would recommend that we try it. What what yeah. do we use it for at home? I just can't. Yeah, sure. So if, with all the pictures. Oh, well, pictures. yeah. So um, the thing that I would recommend looking at OpenStack at home for, or on your work computer. I say at home because I work from home. Um, check it out at work. Is uh, because if you have 
requests coming in, if people come to you and say, I need storage, I need a VM, I need something provisioned. Usually we need storage because all the disks are full. It's all the disks are full. Right. Well, okay, fair enough. So assuming that there is storage somewhere that is available to allocate to, to people in your uh, in, enterprise. Um, but at home, it, it could be much the same, right? Um, you Let's say that you uh, have, you've got one um, NAS, you have a one, one drive NAS, right? Hook another one up to it. For the sake right? of discussion, carry on. Yeah. Then uh, you can use OpenStack and they'll both be presented as one, one device to any other systems. Um, and OpenStack does not just have to be for virtual systems, right? You can uh, have OpenStack engage with bare metal as well. If you, if you have a lab at home, it would be really, really cool. If you have a lab at home, it's great. Um, if, if you have a lab at work, it's great. Things that OpenStack, that I didn't really get into, but networking, if you've ever had to fight with subnets, uh, VLAN tagging, mm -hmm. anything like that, OpenStack is awesome. Uh, so I would definitely recommend checking it out. It is like a whole three days conference though on that. Yes? So right now I'm actually working on owning all of my family's uh, Dropbox. I'm moving it over to OnCloud. Right OnCloud? now I just have it, yes. Okay, okay. I have yeah. it hosted on a VPS from DigitalOcean. Would yep. OpenStack be a better, uh, way of, yeah. Oh so, yeah, so that's a tough question. Um, are you doing any processing, or are you just straight like everything's going in the own cloud as it is? Yes. I don't think OpenStack would necessarily be a good solution for that. Okay. Um, I think that if you looked at uh, an object store backing own cloud, then that would be something. Um, if put on my uh, community hat, or, or like keep on my community hat when I say this, uh, look at Ceph. Right? You don't have to go to Red Hat and buy Ceph to use it, right? There's open source Ceph. But it is an, uh, uh, an object storage that you can use to back own cloud. Um, okay. And that may be something that will help with that. The open stack would be good if you're like, okay, I want to take everything and make it, uh, all of it is going to be you know, JPEG at 90% quality and this you know, pixel size. Then you can use open stack to do that processing on the fly. But, other, but essentially just copying it straight up is probably overkill. Uh, yes, is there? Yeah, if you could help me understand, I'm a little lost in understanding the difference between un uh, a block device versus the object orientation source because in the end it's all a binary value within, on the disk space associated to the MDR. Yes. So it's there or it's duplicated anywhere. Um, from when the gentleman in the middle kind of elaborated somewhat, I understood that, hey, I can take and look at matching values and say it's duplicate, I won't duplicate if I migrate it over to a different drive. Mm -hmm. If that's so, that's somewhat valuable, but how do you understand the differential factor to what is duplicate, what is not, mm -hmm. and where is it really coming a functional process to utilize, say, off of my NAS or my SAN in my house, yeah. or my small business orientation? Sure. So, uh, you're yeah, absolutely right. When we talk about file storage, um, object storage, block storage, it's um, it's not quite analogous to a protocol, but it's kind of the same, right? So if you mount an NFS share, somewhere on the other side is going to be a spinning disk or an SSD, right? With a file system, EXT, <coughs> whatever. Um, butter if you're, you know, living on the edge. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to when you when you mount that share. Uh, there's protocols in place to help make sure that there's authentication, redundancy, write checks, you know, signing off, and all that stuff. So object store is versus block store is kind of the same. So block store is pretty much what everybody who's ever created a file system has probably used, right? Um, you have the device, and then it presents blocks like 4K blocks. 8K block, whatever, or... And the only time you know or care is when you run out of inodes. Is when you run out of inodes, yes. Uh, yeah, inode 64 is the flag of the future. Right? Um, so, like, you... Uh, that, that's what we're used to. And as a developer, when you write an application that leverages a file system, right, you, especially when you're writing out that, 
like you or your operating system has to make checks to make sure that you don't overwrite something else on the block, right? Because uh, ideally it will be a long sequential, um, uh, you know, of course fragmentation happens, but let's say you've got a brand new disk, it just writes off, right? And then it will try and pick back up um, and start writing again, where, I mean, depending on all sorts of factors, um, in the most efficient way possible, but it will still try and get contiguous space. Object storage is a layer above that, right? There is still the file system underneath, okay? Um, but uh, there is a, I, I, I use the word translator, um, an application, whatever you want to call it, that provides the, um, an API layer to get the objects that you want, right? So when you are, when we were talking about um, pictures, right? Pictures have file names that change and whatever, but there is metadata inside a picture that is important that you would use to say, is this the same file? Is this the same content? The EXIF data, right? Um, so an object uh, application would say, give me a picture, give me its EXIF data, I will compare that. And then the underlying uh, object application, translator, whatever, would go and grab the picture off the disk from wherever it is. Oftentimes it is chunked and stored in a distributed fashion. That's what makes object store very good is that you can keep adding data, you can keep adding drives to the object store. You don't have to extend the file system. As a, uh, as a user, you don't have to extend the file system. Object store technologies like Ceph take care of that automatically. Uh, it detects there's new uh, resources in the pool and it starts a rebalance. Um, but you don't have to worry about like, oh, open it and uh, as the application developer, you're just like, give me the picture, let me know when I've got it, read the exit data, and then I'm on my way. Um, does that help? Does that make sense? It's a process or an API running on user level or a user agent that leverages the standard MDRX EXD for partitioning system to run at a more of a faster and efficient rate than actually always asking the disk level, where is this at? Yeah, so... Um, it, it's just adding another ahead, layer, please. right? Yeah. I mean, it's just putting a layer between us and the block, so we don't have to worry about that part. Level. We're just... A higher level layer. Right. Right, and so the... It's like, oh, why would we do that? Why would we, why would we make it slower? Um, is because you can... Because we have network speeds that are so fast these days. We have interconnects, we have fiber channel, we have uh, storage fabrics, um, FCOE, all these different ways of getting information concurrently from multiple locations, right? So, well, even if it's not cached, right? Let's say that, um, you know, each of you knows a, 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 a prime number. Right, and uh, if I say, "All right, everybody, give me prime numbers uh, every, at once!" Right, everybody, shout their prime numbers out at me. Yeah, <laughs> perfect, great, <laughs> perfect. So, if I can computationally handle that, then that's much faster than me going to five of you and saying, "Okay, you five, give me all the prime numbers for this." Right, so um, that is kind of like object storage, right? Um, and there are other uh, benefits to object storage from a development point of view. Right? If you have a um, somebody who never has to write uh, file operation functions, it's a happy day, right? They, if, if they don't have to have that, we were talking about security earlier, right? If somebody who is going to get a uh, picture, right? Let's say that it's medical information, right? And someone says, "Give me the scan of that uh, off of that MRI," and they don't have access. Their application will never actually have access to the store itself. It will just have access to the API. Then there are a number of ways that you can control that. You could revoke their authentication. You could change the API address. You could disable the API entirely. Um, but all I can sit here to think is these folks out here never had to learn. Uh, IBM OS 370 uh, job control language to understand what it is to access block storage. 
Well, and thank God. Exactly. Well, <laughs> um, okay, so your, your so, solution supersedes that by a lot of so, way. So sort of getting back to the 50,000 foot view of OpenStack. Okay. You're saying it's a collection of, like Linux is to all the GNU utilities and the yeah. kernel and everything else, it's a collection of all these pieces that are basically the cloud system or the where things are going scalability wise for Linux. Are the the bets placed on that? I mean, is that what we're calling it from now on? Is this the future? I, I, or, or is this, <laughs> I mean, or is this just something you really like? Or, you know, is it, is it Red Hat's thing? Or just, just oh, curious. Oh, well, no, no. So Red Hat does offer OpenStack, but it is not Red Hat's thing, right? Mm -hmm. no. um, group, yeah. So it is a, it is a separate thing. Um, OpenStack is its own foundation. Um, and I would say that the things that OpenStack offers they may not win at, win at all adoption, right? But if you, when, when um, storage companies are providing uh, you know, drivers to, to, to provide um, block and, and object storage, when Cisco is selling um, switches that can work with software-defined networking instead of using uh, the proprietary Cisco, you know, functionality. I mean, that's that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. Ten years from now, who knows? I don't know, but um, but the community behind OpenStack is die. so strong. Did it die? Oh no, it's just me. I'm sorry. I think we're back. The community behind. No, it's. It cuts in there. Um, yeah. Mike. 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 Transfer. Ooh. Sorry, I gotta get used to the appropriate distance now. Um, the the community behind OpenStack is so strong. Every six months they put out a new release, um, and it, it it it's iterative releases, right? It's not like uh, if you're familiar with Red Hat, where it's like six and then seven, and there's major changes between. Um, some stuff between OpenStack versions may change. Some stuff may not between um, their version. It's more like uh, if you're familiar with Fedora, right? How quickly it it moves. Um, Kind of the same thing. So, uh, I like OpenStack. Um, I like the idea that you can have workloads dispersed between locations, have a common identity management between them, and then have, because uh, that's what we didn't really even get into, but it does allow identity management at a project level much like what we were talking about in the previous thing, right? So if even though I have relative root access on one project, I may only have read or dev access on another, but nothing has to be redeployed, right? Um, so I think it's very strong in that aspect. Um, that is good. So that's the big, that's the big stuff, right? That, to me, that is like where Linux is helping drive massive worldwide uh, resource pooling uh, and, 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 and build outs, um, as well as things like CERN, which is just an amazing amount of computation. Please. Would it be fair to say that OpenStack is essentially the, the open source community version of the VMware suite of hypervisors? No, no. No, VMware, um, so VMware is pretty much just the compute aspect of it. That is my, this is my personal, right? I don't know, they, keep they saying this. But I can't but, so they have like vCloud, like, right? Or whatever, but. Some of them are interchangeable with OpenStack, we'll understand, you know, they, they can work together yeah. in part. 
so there are um, pe people are writing drivers where if you want to use sender right if you want to have block storage that is presented you don't have to have an OpenStack deployment in order to take advantage of that like there are drivers where you could use um, ESX or whatever to mount a sender thing I don't actually know if ESX of course it or not but I wouldn't be surprised if it if it doesn't now maybe in the future I don't I don't really know I mean OpenStack is not like to me OpenStack is the whole package right you don't have to use the whole package but you don't have to try and piece stuff together like I feel like you have all these disparate technologies that you're trying to get to work together right OpenStack has a common standardized messaging backend right and that is but I could see it being analogous it is a, like a virtualization and say cloud management suite is that OpenStack yeah, yeah, uh, well, but when you say virtualization, like, we want to be clear, like, so OpenStack started, NASA needed a way to do software-defined compute, networking, and storage. Um, and so when you have a virtual appliance, be it a, something out of VirtualBox or ESX or, or Rev or KVM or whatever, it has all those aspects to it, right? It probably has a network address, probably has some storage, probably has some compute, but it's a lot. Like, you, you build it, and that's it. You can't really change that without at least a reboot, if not a redeploy. So I feel like OpenStack is virtualization. It's like, it's like a whole new world of virtualization, right? It's like we've gotten used to the idea of, like, virtualizing, and the first thing you define is the number of CPUs. OpenStack is that plus everything else. Um, I, don't, I, I do want to get into containers because I think this might be what folks are really going to be interested in. Um, so I'm sorry to, to, to jump, but I will be here for a while afterwards if anyone wants to talk more afterwards. So what is a container? A container is an entire runtime environment. It's an application plus its dependencies, libraries, and other binaries, and the configuration files needed to run it bundled into one package. Who's used containers? Good, 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 good. good. Who's um, who, those who have not heard, or those who have not used containers, I think I did it backwards, right? I was supposed to say, like, who's heard of containers first? Is that right? <laughs> who's heard of it but not used it? Okay. Um, so, containers, this, this diagram, can y'all read this up here? No. Any of that? No? What am I going to make it bigger? Um, This is important. I want to make sure that we can see this aspect of it. Maybe. Shoot. I don't want you. Um, yeah, down on my feet. I didn't do anything, did it? There's a slider in the bottom corner. I can't quite. Oh, I can see it over. Nope, can't see it over there either. Uh, Um, that's what I'm trying to get to is the zoom. There it is over here. All right. So this is. Can y'all see? Is this coming into focus over here yet? Yay. All right. So this is your traditional, what you would get with um, any sort of virtualization, right? You've uh, traditional virtualization. You have your hardware. Um, it could be hardware, it could be another virtual machine, it could be in the cloud, it could be whatever. And you've got a Linux kernel running on it, um, and then hypervisor technology that is um, you know, providing the translation. Uh, oftentimes this is you know, on CPU and, and then drivers within your uh, devices. And then when you want to get new instances of these applications, right, you start up a whole new stack. Virtual machine A is for anyone on the virtual machine, it's a whole entire stack. It has its own kernel, it has its own networking, it's got its own user space, it's got everything, and then there's an application right on top of it. And that's all you need is just that little application, but you have to start this whole virtual machine to get it. Same over here, and here, and here, and here. 
And so uh, it takes time to start. Um, it takes resources to start. It takes uh, management, right? Security, you wanna patch them. Um, it takes all these extra things to make sure that you can just run application A separately from application B. And this, in a way, is like saying that OpenStack does not solve all the problems, right? Because uh, when we were talking about compute before, we were and saying, oh, you'll start an instance, that's a virtual machine. So this is somewhere where, depending on your workload, you may find OpenStack is not advantageous out of the box, but containers could be. Um, containers, however, when you have a, uh, sorry, if anybody has this thing, the same think pads as, as I do, the like mouse pad is just like awful. Uh, so uh, here we have hardware, uh, we have the kernel, and then we have a container host. This is akin to the hypervisor before. Um, uh, so then we have a container and it's running application A, and that's all it's doing. Application B, and that's all it's doing. Application C, and that's all it's doing. It does not have to have an entirely new kernel running on it. It doesn't have to have new drivers running. It doesn't have to have anything, right? It says, I will have inside of my container only what I need. Everything else will be inherited from further down the stack. Very quick to stand up, very quick to scale. Um, startup time is like your application starting, not your entire operating system starting. Um, so now that we've seen that, let me go back to, so I can go. Okay, so virtual machines provide an entire system. The hardware, the kernel, the operating system, the applications. Containers rely on the underlying container host to provide everything except what is needed to run the application in the container. So applications running in containers will be available and providing services faster than if you have to spin up entire virtual machines. Um, so there's a speed improvement both in starting the container and its operation. Um, you don't need to have another kernel, you don't have another abstracted hardware. Uh, and then you can also rapidly um, provision it uh, and, and, and kill it, right? Who's heard of like pets versus cattle? <coughs> A few people. Herding, herding cats versus herding. No, 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 like, all right, so you have a cat, right? Or, or a dog, a pet. Um, and if it gets sick, you take care of it. You take it to the vet and you love on it. It has a name. If you ever heard of cattle and one gets sick, you have steak. So, like, virtual machine, or not, not say, sorry, if there's vegetarians in the room. Yeah, so. Don't eat sick meat, that's it. Well, let's say that it breaks its leg. <laughs> sorry, I'm not a farmer. <laughs> we don't want encephala, in, in sponge, in. Spongiform, spongiform we don't want that, right? <laughs> if your cat breaks its leg, you take it to the vet. If your, uh, one of your herd breaks its leg, you grind it up and beat it to the other cats. <laughs> Just like containers. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so. But yeah, VMs are your pets, right? You give it a name. You you want to make sure that it, it stays healthy. You gotta patch it. You gotta take care of it. You people rely on it. If a virtual machine goes down, you're gonna get a call. If a container goes down, then the container hosts make sure that nobody gives a shit. Right? Like, who cares? Because, sorry. You're going to get a call. Well, you'll get a Well, so that's the whole thing, is that, like, in a well-deployed system, right? Like, uh, what are the thing? Um, you just hit the magic word. What? Well deployed. Okay, well deployed. But that's the thing. Okay, I will take a step back and say that everything that we're talking about today is a perfect world where network cards don't fail. Cables are well-patched. Um, Let us know when you find that. Yeah, right, right. in a virtual machine. It's great. Uh, but yeah, so, um, however, if things do go sideways, then your, uh, you know, it, Puppet or Ansible or whatever you're using, because God help us if you're using, if you're doing things manually without any sort of automation these days, right, um, will recover gracefully. Right? I mean, and that's kind of the whole idea is that how, what is your time to recovery? Like, what does it take to get back to your SOE? You know, these are um, things that maybe, 
maybe some, it may not be important for everybody, right? It's kind of like the system D conversation. Does uh, everybody need it? No. Wes will let but me mess with you. they have a choice? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, CentOS 6 is going to be developed for another, like, 10 years, so. Oh, God. Uh, you know, what, what I think the reaction we got here was yeah. that we all work in a real environment, mm -hmm. and we all know that it's just a different circus, but it's the same clowns. That's fair enough. But if you can protect users from themselves, then, you know, we, we've made progress. Um, two types of containers. Before I was a, before I worked at Red Hat, um, I was a, a developer. Before that, I was an admin at a home health company in South Mississippi, where it was like, they had not seen computers before they went to work. So I, I am not like, oh God, everything's perfect in the real, in all data centers everywhere. Far from. Um, just slight credit, uh, I guess. Cleaning out a closet post Katrina was like the worst thing. Um, that was a long recovery period, for sure. All right, so there's two types of containers. There's host-based and image-based. Host-based is what most people are familiar with. Um, everything, uh, you, when you run application A, B, and C, they're all gonna use the same kernel. They're all gonna use the same drivers. Um, that's kind of the traditional container world. However, there are image-based containers as well. So let's say that you want to test application A with Python to 4, 2, 7, and 3, right? You can have the same kernel, right? So you have an x86, and then in runtime A, you have one version of Python. B has another, C has a third. You can run your application concurrently and run tests against it. Um, without having to spin up anything new. The, uh, the Python binary and related libraries all live inside the image container, the, the yeah, we'll say the image-based container. Um, so uh, you can have your choice. Um, because some people, like originally people were like, well, why, what's the good part? The good part about containers is if I have to have VMs for all my different environments anyway. You can use image-based containers to build out just enough of your environment, and then um, you can still have all the similar, all the things that are similar uh, running underneath. So, where do you get containers? Um, Docker. Who's who's heard of Docker? More people have heard of Docker than I think more people have heard of containers. So, Docker is container. Um, that was like a very brief thing. Yes, please. What's new at OpenBZ? I don't know. What is that? Help me. Containers. It's been around for like. No. Yeah. 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 Open VZ. Open VZ. Why? Tell me why. Why do I know that? But I can't. It's a broken. It predates all a lot of the other container stuff. Yeah. Okay. So is it uh, like old LXC kind of stuff? It when predates LXC. Pre, pre LXC. Dang. Uh. So what's new in it? I don't know. I mean, Docker Nothing. is just a good UI. Like, nobody's heard of LXC. Who's well, heard of LXC? Yeah. Okay, LXC, some people have heard of LXC. Uh, chroot, if anyone's used the chroot environment. SE Linux, those are all old container things that we were using before they were called containers. SE Linux is not a container. SE Linux is a labeling system, not a container. SE Linux will keep your kernel from executing. It creates environments where, depending on the boundaries, you will either have execution or not. It's one so your environment. Your boundaries exist because of your labels. It's a mandatory it's access it's control. Yeah. We still have to see a group and same installed Linux. I think we can pen this discussion for later. <laughs> so. Just trust us as he not going to take it. So Docker <laughs> is. It would be easier. It would. <laughs> okay, so uh, it is. When people, when we, when we would go into places, when I would go to see a customer and say, they would say, oh God, containers, I have no idea what a container is. We would say like, well, you have been using things that are either built into or similar to containers for a while. Docker, what does it do? Docker did make it easy to manage containers in a way that um, was, was kind of the whole infrastructure, right? So you can use Docker to uh, to build your container, it, it is a it is a specification for 
uh, containers because before that it was kind of like back when there was KVM and Zen and all the others. Right now, it's pretty much one um, interoperable virtual Docker. The Open Containers Initiative, their format has been pretty much adopted to it. It's also the platform, um, but it's also, I don't think I put it, no. Um, it is the whole, like, how do you keep your containers sane? Uh, so if you, if you, people are like, well, I'm not gonna run containers because I don't trust where it came from. Then you can use the Docker registry to like sign and within an organization you can have everything that, that is trusted. So the reason that it's... I heard that. <laughs> I'm glad you joined us. So um, who uses Docker? Uh, these are some examples of folks that use Docker if you wanna go check them out. Uh, download it from docker.io. Um, I think containers are more things that people who are providing development environments on demand are going to be more interested in, right? So if you have, yeah, please. Oh, I, I, it's just a question about the Docker idea. Wouldn't they still have security? I mean, if they're, like they're built on old libraries and, and things like that, and they're all contained in one, wouldn't we still have a lot of vulnerabilities and problems? It, you were saying it's sort of to eliminate some security concerns, you could have this idea of this container where everything is built into one segment and it's all patched and put together in one piece. Wouldn't, aren't there still going to be problems because they're built on old libraries? But you have to update all the pieces together and so on. Yeah, so it's a good, a good point. All right, so uh, y'all remember this one? Um, so here I've got one kernel, two kernels, three kernels, four kernels, and different workloads on all of them. So if I want to patch it, I have to make sure that four systems and four groups of people are happy and I've got my maintenance window set up and everybody can agree that this is when we're gonna have a patch cycle. Right here, it's just uh, one. One environment has to be patched. Now, the users, That assumes whatever. that all four of those, uh, or the, the layers on top of that, all play nice with the underlying piece. Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah well, I mean, yeah, this is, <laughs> this doesn't solve the people problem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and now your patching takes down four of us. I'm sorry, say again? And now patching the kernel takes down four of us. They take on, uh, Never mind. Never I'm mind. sorry. <laughs> Tell me later, please. I'm sorry. Okay, if I understand your question correctly, um, typically like an entire application isn't in a single container, but a single process is in a container. And version control is very easy. So, no. um, <laughs> in terms of rolling, rolling back on containers, a doctor is supposed to make it very easy to just you know, pick out a particular container out of you know what may be a stack. I mean, they out a, a picture of like a shipping you know right. boat with you know intermodal containers stacked all on top of each other, which may like, function as an application. And you might be they, they they basically interwork with each other through APIs, kind of like the Lego. That all is how the sales brochure works very nicely. Okay, that's how when it comes to the real world, all hell breaks loose. Yeah. So you do have to be very careful with containers that you have everybody using the same um, images, right? Version control uh, is important. Um, Docker does. That's one of the things, right? What What does Docker do? Like Docker is the whole thing, right? Um, so that's that's how that's managed. In a way, but you don't have to do it all yourself, right? If you, some people use like Jenkins to, you know, build the containers, right? You don't have to use um, Docker to do all of that stuff. So you were saying something about like uh, how do how do things get deployed? But, oh, and, and almost every Docker image I've ever seen, the first thing that happens is upgrades all the libraries. So like it, it does. If like shell shock, you'd be vulnerable in, in your Docker image, right? Yeah, if bash is included in right. the in the uh, container image, yeah, yeah, you would be definitely. Um, but you don't have to batch the kernel. The kernels, right? Well, you already have to batch the kernel. But but if anyway. you, uh, yeah, that's the thing. Well, yeah, you should be batching the kernel. But if you have like Sorry. four containers, that's one of the things. Like if you have four processes on a single VM, then you need to patch bash once for that VM. If you have six containers that all have bash included then hopefully uh you patch it once and then your ci all rolls and it gets deployed and that's great if you have that all set up but like it may be the case that you have 
six different containers and you have to patch bash in all each six, one of those yeah. six containers. Well, that's true. Or so let's say you them. support developers who want to develop on three versions of Python and four versions of whatever else they've got, right? Like Ruby and all these things. And then you're patching your, you're building new gold ISOs anyway, right? For your images. Um, it's not, none of these are like magic bullets, right? A world with containers is better than a world without. I was just concerned, con con considered <laughs> wondering about the patching thing. That's or the well, so the that's, that's akin to the serious. cattle being with a broken leg, right? Yeah. You know, a lot of times, like, well, okay, I'll say that when you patch containers for security issues, it is a little like taking a step backwards and converting them into virtual machines, right? Like into that same model. Instead, it's better to patch your original instead of patching a running container, like kill that and then patch your original and then spin up a new instance. Uh, we got two. So I think first and then second. Well, well I mean, especially when I hear people that come from like a developer background talk, um, one of the reasons they like, like for, for one containers is that they can control the version and they know it's compatible and doesn't break their app. So if you have multiple different apps, could just be completely ending to making a wider attack surface because right. you might have to support five different versions of Python and six different versions of this or seven different versions of that to keep everything running. And I mean, obviously, I mean, this is a lot of this seems to be being pushed by developers anyway. So I don't think we're really looking at this as to increase security, but to uh, alleviate their own headaches of building an app and keeping it running efficiently without it breaking something else. So I just see it being yeah. more. Um, yeah, I don't think you're wrong in that aspect. It's a growing pains moment for sure. Forgive, forgive my ignorance, but on a commercial level, is something like Google App Engine a uh, concept of containers? Um, if I understand Google App Engine being, I don't think I know what that is. I have a guess, but go uh, further. Google has a, a, an initiative that, that you buy a thing, and one thing you can get is virtual machines where you're controlling the whole stack on a virtual image and it boots. But apart from that, they have App Engine, which essentially gives you like a PHP environment or a Python environment. Yes. Yeah. And you just write your app to that and you're not managing any of the underlying server. Is that an example of containerization on a commercial level? Analogous to it's, it. it's definitely analogous to it. So what oh, Docker would enable you to do is provide that internally inside of your own environment. Okay. Right. So I have three statements. <laughs> um, one is that to his question, uh, yes, you're, you're you're absolutely right today, but you could implement security into containers as well, and so therefore you can secure your container up to your standards and then deploy those. Uh, so it can actually be a faster way to patch or, or do whatever. So it doesn't have to be a negative thing. Uh, I believe that Google App Engine is more of a cloud infrastructure instead of a container. Just to be clear. And finally, um, uh, the uh, pets versus cattle argument is not just because uh, you only brought it up on containers, but you can do that same thing in the cloud. So it, it's not a, that's really more about maintenance. It's about like, you don't want to have that box, you don't want to patch that box, just kill it and bring up another one. That's, that's one of the philosophy. So um, I don't, I, I haven't ever met him, but I'm guessing. Is this Dagmar? Yeah. Yes, great. Okay, good. Dagmar, Wesley, Wesley Dagmar. If you're getting Please. the feeling that I'm not a fan of containers, you would be correct. That's totally <laughs> fine. I realized I sounded like a bit of a prick earlier today, earlier when I was like, I'm glad you joined. I am glad that you joined us because I think a lot of people are here to talk about System D as well. We're happy to talk about the warm fuzzies with, you know, clouds and containers. Um, but I think it's, the original purpose of this was to talk about System it's, D, right? It's, 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 not, it's not containers specifically that I have a problem with. It's what they're going to be used for and what they are being used for. Because what I'm yeah. seeing for overwhelmingly is folks that don't know what they're doing. And they want to run DirtPress 6.7. And he comes with these dependencies, and the people that are making DirtPress 6.7 say, here's this container, you can use it. It has all these dependencies in it. They'll never update those dependencies. That's going to be frozen in time forever, and they're probably not going to go and get patches from the guys who released DirtPress 6.0. So as an admin, you're trying to run the system, and you've been doing all of your stuff. You've been following your procedures and your policies, and you've been 
getting your patch windows done, and users need that patch window discipline that the virtual machine environment generally requires, where you say, April 21st, your, your application will be compatible with PHP 5, or good luck, because they won't ever patch. And if you're an admin and you're administrating an environment with multiple users on it and they're running a bunch of containered stuff, you've got nine different versions of PHP and nine different versions of all these little libraries and 25 different versions of all these other little things because all these users go, well, we don't want to break our app, so we won't touch anything in it. And that is a nightmare scenario as a sysadmin standpoint. You're, you're going to be getting just... The, the network security group's going to bring you your email to tell you about the vulnerability triggers in a large box full of DVDs. <laughs> yeah. So one thing to be sure is that any, whether you're rolling Docker, um, something that is the Google Apps thing, um, there are a lot of different ways to deploy containers. None of that means that your users get anything more necessarily, right? You don't have to give them. Let's be Jack. honest here, okay, let's be completely but. honest here. Any one of us in this room can sit here and screw up a perfectly good application in any one of these formats, be they hypervisor, container, docker, you know, I don't, uh, bare, bare metal, we can all do it wrong. I can. <laughs> well, um, so we started about 15 minutes late, so if along, I saw the, the board starting to come in. If we can yeah. wait, we're going to run about 10 minutes longer, if that's okay. And do we want to end it out on System D and yeah, talk so about System D? System. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's totally good. Yeah, definitely. I, I can, so I can yeah, sum up is. this thing on again. It's off here. I keep switching it off. Why do you do that? So my problem with System D comes back to one very key point that I remember seeing on Google+, Plus, Mr. Leonard Pottering. Um, by the way, the redhead rep that came to see me at the office two years ago was not able to promise me five minutes in a room alone with him. And he was saying, oh, we can get you anything you want for a Red Hat conference. I said, five minutes alone in a room with Leonard. He went, what? <laughs> um, but Leonard had this nice and long post. It was, you know, it was a wall of text talking about how, well, we do this, and then we do this to upgrade in it, and then we have to do this, but then we have to remount the root file system, and that causes a main, major problem. Well, he, he basically described this giant circuitous thing where he literally painted himself into a corner, and this is our fundamental problem with all the old school admins that don't like System D, because you're doing all this stuff so that you don't have to, well, you're doing all this stuff, and at one point he winds up, you have to unmount the root file system and bring it back in, and that's a problem? Well, when we had a teeny little init with a maybe four or 500 lines of source code, we never patched that. It didn't need patching ever, and it's just getting larger and larger and larger and larger. That's our main problem there. We had a nice tiny little init. We never had to screw with it. Most of us probably even, we'd go entire distribution releases, never see it patched once. Because it didn't do anything except for, you know, kick some other apps off. We didn't have to worry about whether or not we had to remount root file system or do this terrifying thing with an NITRD or any fancy stuff. It was all simple. <laughs> and, and Leonard, it seems to, chronically not notice when he's painting himself in a corner and go, well, what I need is a helicopter to get me out of this little room. <laughs> so how many in here know what System D is? How many don't know what System D is? Okay, I'm not a really good describer of this. I was just kind of made aware of it. Monolithic. Um, what's that? It's a monolithic init. Right, like so <laughs> back in the it's old days, like how, Unix, how <laughs> Unix has always started has been this series of, of bootstraps, right? pieces built on top of each other that call pieces and so on. And so now, um, to fix some problems that some people don't think were real problems that some people do, there's this big argument in the community and even some forks of, of Linux about what, how we're going to have the new startup environment. System D is going to uh, take care of uh, uh, logging levels and uh, various other functions and a lot of people have a problem with it because it's like a black box. We can't see what's inside the box, right? That's the that's right. essentially what people are, uh, sysadmins are frustrated with. And then the other side of that is it allows some good things too, like logging outside of containers. That was a big problem before. Sending messages back down the a CH rooted environment or whatever, trying to get it outside. What the problem? Well, I, some people disagree, so, right? So there, there's, there are pros and cons about this, and the community is really split. So that, that, that was kind of the, gonna be 
part of the discussion too. And that, that's sort of what system D is. It's how the system is going to be started up in the future. And then the, the on top of interesting thing about this is, is that the large companies that are driven by the enterprise, for instance, Red Hat, is backing the system D side. And so the future of Linux, if we want, if they want to stay in line with where the money is, where, where manufacturers are paying, they're going to go with the system D environment. And all the sysadmins who've been, who, who are against it are kind of frustrated because they, they feel like their choice has been taken away from them. And it hasn't, but if they want to stay with where the money goes, they're going to have to learn it. And, and so it's a, that's the How contention. How is different from not having the choice taken away? Well, you can have the money or you can have the choice. You can afford <laughs> Linux, right? It's open source. You can do whatever you want. But if you if you don't if you don't want to buy that if you don't want to use that application that your company wants to use, or your company wants to use a certain application and it's only going to run on System D environment, yeah, you're going to have to learn it. You're right. Oh, at least until System D goes and absorbs the kernel. <laughs> so I think both sides make valid points. Let's be honest about this, okay? <laughs> the, the, you know, let's face it, we've come from, as Groucho Marx so succinctly said it, we come from nothing to a state of extreme poverty. So, are there any questions about System D? Does anybody have any comments on it or experience with it in the field that they want to talk about? Because that was something that, originally when, I, I was the one that proposed the idea for this panel, and I was at Dragon Con uh, with Mr. Scott Jones there, and we had this really packed room, this big discussion about it, because there were a lot of people, developers are very much in for, for it, I think, but a lot of sysadmins are very much against. It's kind of brought out a lot of old uh, and, loyalties. And who's responsible for keeping the system running of that two groups of people? It's a, it's a war, it's a philosophy thing, right? Question. When they run all the code that runs the entire OS, it is a developer. <laughs> it's still be a dumb question from somebody who knows. I still don't know what this is. There's but no stupid questions, I, just um, stupid people. <laughs> <laughs> you just said system D developers like it, sysadmins don't. What about a system D for developers and system S for sysadmins and maybe the point you'll need? I mean, so at some point, you do have to have something that starts the computer. Um, we had something. Well, <laughs> so we did, and, and you know, I, I don't those wire disagree. Red cords just got to be a real pain in the butt. You know what? Yeah, I, I, I feel like the system D conversation has fractured into three conversations. Like, there's the personality behind system D, which is an interesting conversation because I don't think in anything else except for you know Jobs, Gates. Balmer and Torvalds, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, and let's not forget Solomon. But well, like yeah. for you know personalities, like who cares, right? Um, I think that the, in a community that is built on electronic communication, it is important to have decorum, and sometimes I think pottering doesn't right he doesn't know what to say in a way that will make any points understandable over email right? um but so that's one thing is that people read this stuff and they're like oh my god what the hell is this and we're going to replace our entire infrastructure by something written by a kid right um that's fair i think that's a valid criticism because in this community we do communicate over email and there is importance in if you're going to try and pitch an idea for the most part you should be able to speak about it and not piss people off um, but two the idea that we've been doing it the same way forever and that is the one well and then three is system d has gotten too big right i don't i don't disagree with that either i think that this idea that we can fold everything into system d and hope for the best is going to be problematic yeah but i think the biggest issue with system d is that it changes what we've been doing forever and ever and ever and ever in the unix environments and it only goes back to 1970 that's not forever that's pre-epoch <laughs> there was no time before 1970 so um the uh 
And I, I don't know that system D is the be all for that, but we needed something that could handle a, we, I think that we need a, we need a init um, process that was not so serialized that you didn't have to put things into FS tab so you didn't block on boot because networking wasn't available, right? Yeah, and, and but, so, but now we've got this one piece that's becoming larger and larger, which is essentially a mono. But that's part three. That's part three, right? I think that what systemd has done, and I'm not going to defend the code. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to defend it. They'll boot faster. It's, well, no, not boot even back. that. I don't, uh, who boot cares about booting faster? I want, an, <laughs> I want something that is not just going to be for a data, for a piece of big iron, right? I want an init that is flexible enough, and I'm not saying systemd is it, but I want something that is flexible enough to boot on, you know, microwaves and refrigerators and space stations and satellites and desktops and you know, Mars rovers that will not have to boot serially on a premise that was decided 60, 70 years ago. It's not like, and I think that, I'm not saying that we should throw everything out. I think that System D started a conversation that we had had, we had had a sacred cow in the init program that we had not been willing to address. And I, I, my worry is that the critiques of system D are getting lost because they're saying, well, it changes things. Well, excuse me. Well, yeah. well no, we've just, we've given the same specific reasons why we don't like it over and over and they've been ignored over and over, so we just get tired of saying it. Well, normally when we do develop, we have these tiny little pieces that you can swap out at will. Somebody comes up with a new one, we run it for a while, some people run it, some people don't. Eventually, we wind up discarding the parts that no one likes, and we just get the good stuff out of it. But we don't get to do that with System D. Well, if we're going to get to do it with anything. Deal, then it we're is a always nip. stuck with the binary logs, which are, they're just a disaster waiting to happen for some folks. And we're stuck with the fact that it's all one piece, so any updates that need to be changed to system D affect all of this, this part of the system. Instead of being able to just pop this one little piece out and replace it without even making the system hiccup, now it's attached to all these other things and they all have to temporarily go down as well. So That's not making us happy at all. I think... Uh, so we had a, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure you got the question. Well, I think you, you started to cover things. I just wanted to um, remind everybody that, that one of the points of system D was to move from a state transition machine to a dependency graph, but you already talked about serialization, but... Uh, and Upstart was really doing great work yeah, on that. Upstart, that start was the, yeah, and so system D replaced Upstart. So you, you kind of get back to an architectural uh, situation where, you know, it's really a question of architecture, and it's um, that, that issue, uh, it, it's not necessarily, I mean, it could be anything, it could be anything anywhere. And it, it's, it gets to be a broader question of whether, you know, whether Red Hat is, a, is, is, is being a good steward of Linux or not. Um, it goes beyond, and it's a, it goes beyond uh, Red Hat in that regard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it, but. Uh, I think your points are very well taken. All right. And, and, and again, I think there's, there's a case to be made for the, the modular piece by piece uh, environment with which we are familiar, and you will admit. Uh, familiarity yeah. breeds contempt and or uh, well, comfort, either one. Okay, and, and likewise, and there's a need for, uh, shall we say, parallelization as well as, you know, are we parallelizing or paralyzing? It's your choice. <laughs> so so we, we need to wrap up the next couple minutes, so just maybe one more question. Yeah. Okay, so I've been studying you know, the DevOps approach and culture lately. You, you start with a minimum viable product and then dev and off collaborate better with each other through continuous development of something that works. And kind of with, with this online writing lately, hearing the, the dispute between you know, development wants this and you know, ops wants, wants this, it, it sounds like what you have is a minimum viable product maybe the system D 2.0 maybe that ultimately there'll be that compromise and that's what, that's what we'll <laughs> or maybe we'll just wait until system D gets its own modular dependency system that would be good. so any any 
other thoughts, guys? Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks, thanks, so thanks so much. Thanks, Wesley. Thank I don't think we introduced ourselves, but Wesley um, is, he, he's part of Inlug. Howard is part of Inlug. I go to Inlug. I think you're on the mail list. <laughs> but, uh, so the Nashville Linux users group, if any of you are interested in Linux and, and live in the Nashville area, come check it out. Uh, there's a lot of, of good information that gets Clearly there. you start showing up more. <laughs> It's a, uh, so uh, yeah, Tuesday, if you're local, Tuesday night, uh, Vanderbilt's MRB3, uh, big room. 1220. 1220, 6 p.m. Second, second Tuesday of each month. Second Tuesday of each month, and this is the thing. Yeah, yes. All right, Thank thanks, you. guys.